So I'm telling you, all the diasporans outside, you also need to make a conscious effort to come to support. I mean, it's nice to support and make money, right? But the idea, the, the reason that you come here shouldn't be making money first. It should be making a change first. Then when the money comes, aiming to that, that's a double win for all of us. My name is Patricia Che. I'm the CEO for Wildwood Resort at Lake Hissel. I keep telling people that it's a dream. It's a dream come true. It's all about having that nice, serene, quiet, uh, family-friendly place for everyone. Wow. <laughs> it began some 24 years ago. I was young. I visited Disney World on a class trip. You know, my first trip outside of home um, in New York. And I knew we were going to Disney World, but I didn't know what Disney World was even about. And we get there and I'm like, oh my God, this place is like heaven. So I was all excited. I'm trying to figure out like, did somebody create this? Is this a governmental project? Like, what is this place? I mean, being a kid in Ghana, never hearing of Disney World, imagine like, you know, at the age of like 15, I'm in Disney World and I'm like, wow. So I'm going on all the rides, right? The baby rides, teacup rides, like you name it. My friends are like, what's the matter with you, Patricia? I mean, don't you have Disney World in Africa? And I'm like, no. But I'm going to have one when I grow up. And that's how the dream started. I went, I full gear tried to get my Disney World. Thank Disney World was like way before IBM. I was a senior in high school uh, because I was young. That is because I was jumped. So I go to start thinking, <clears throat> I want to build something in Ghana. So right there, I started figuring out like, how do you get a land in Ghana? How do you make money? Like all these questions came up. And then I learned at 16, you could work. As long as your grades were higher, and your parents and principal approves it. So the following year, I asked my parents if I could work. Like, well, why do you need a job? Like, <laughs> I'm going to build a Disney World. <laughs> you know, you need to study, you need to go to college, blah, blah, blah. I go to my principal, ask him, um, can I work? He checks my grades, like, yeah, yeah, you can work. Ask my parents. My dad is like, no, no, you can't work. You know, you, you, what do you need money for? For Disney World. <laughs> you know? So finally he approves it and I went to work for McDonald's. And that's where I made my first $300. Sent it to Ghana for a land. Like, I didn't know. I thought, you know, $300 could do something. But that was the beginning. The first $300. That my mom, who was actually my aunt, who was taking care of me in Ghana, kept for like, I think five years. That saved $300 for me to like add more and get the Disney World started, you know, so that was really cool. <laughs> I was more like inquisitive. In Ghana, I remember, I'm still in touch with my second grade um, teacher and we had the same name, um, Ajua Foriwa, and she's uh, Joanna Foriwa, Madame Joanna, shout out. So the very first time I walked into her class, she's like, oh my, like, you know, I too cute. I'm always inquisitive. How does this work? I want to know more about this, that, you know. So I got interested in school because of my second grade teacher. And I'm like the teacher's pace. You know, like, oh, I'll take care of the class when you're not here. Like, okay, you be the class prefect. I don't know if, you know, you have that in. We don't have that in the U.S. I think it's the student body president. But um, in Ghana, I was the class prefect. And from second grade, I was always the class prefect in every class. Teacher leaves, I take over the class. You know, that was the kind of kid I was. <laughs> Believe me, like now, like when I first got to Ghana, I used to go to the local schools around here. And the kids, 
he used to call me Pat. And now, you know, it went from Pat to Sister Pat, and now it's Mama Pat, because I'm, I'm getting older. But believe me, I'm like the biggest kid you ever find. I'm always playing, I'm always joking. I think I'm never gonna grow up. When the adults are going, I'm with them. When the kids are going, I'm right there with them. So, you know, I'm gonna be a child forever. And that's what this place is supposed to be about. Like a CEO walks in and take the shoes off, play football, eat on the ground, that kind of place, you know. So the process in which I acquired the land, in the beginning, it wasn't like a sudden need for a land. It wasn't urgent. It was just that um, it was a dream. It was like my life's dream to build this place. And everybody in Ghana knows about the fact that I went to Disney World. And when I came out, I became a different person and obsessed with building one. So throughout childhood, it was just a mission, like a long-term mission to find land. So the, the process was just gradual. I kept telling everybody that I wanted the land, but um, I didn't get up one day and, and say that, oh, today is the day I'm gonna get the land, no. It was more like I was telling everybody slowly, like, please, I'm looking for this, I'm looking for land, a big piece of land, especially my mom. And she used to work at KNUST and had many friends who were professors and lecturers. And I think that she talked to one of the professors in the building and construction, she invited my mom here to take a look at the lake. I think it was probably her first time here. So when she saw it, she asked me to come down to Ghana and see the land. I remember when I got to Ghana and we were getting, I mean, driving to Lake Busum Chase seemed like it was forever. 30 kilometers, bad road. It, it was just <laughs> very interesting. I would say adventurous. We got here and it looked like the middle of nowhere. There were trees everywhere. It looks like a thick forest. Um, to even see Busum Chase, we had to hire a young man to create a path you know, in the bushes for us to walk through to get a glimpse of the lake. And when I saw the lake, it was like, oh my goodness, this is it, this is it, this is it. It was a gradual process, but the getting of the paperwork, the, you know, the, the paperwork took quite a long time. So, uh, you know, I, I want advice anybody who want to move down to Africa to really pay attention to their paperwork, make sure everything is intact and make sure everything is legally done. <laughs> no, I work hard. I don't sleep. And I think it's a lot of sacrifice, um, perseverance, because it's a lot of hardships doing business in Ghana. I mean, I, I'm like the advocate for every diaspora moving to Ghana. But I mean, let's face it. It's a lot of hardships in doing business in Ghana. Um, infrastructure is not there, roads, um, electricity. It, it, it's so much hardships. I think if I wasn't young, the time I came to Ghana and I was a little older, I would have probably given up because it's just so hard to do anything. Even getting transportation to bring stuff to the lake was impossible. So. It's nice that we are inviting people to come to Ghana and help, but we have to do our best to make sure that when they come, the system is set up, or at least we are in the process of setting it up for people to be able to help. Because if you come and everything is impossible and you lose everything, I mean, you can lose everything. I got different stories about losing everything. So, I mean, it's hard. And that's the whole point. We want to help the country to move forward. But when sometimes you feel like there's nothing to go on, it's, it's like you give up and leave. And we don't want that. We really want to move and stay and help move the country forward. So if you are coming in, just know that it's not perfect. 
it's not even good. But the whole point is we trying to get it on the right path so it can be good. The network is really important. And I know there are a couple of offices, like when I came, all of this, because I, I got here 2010, like none of these existed, or if they did, I wasn't aware of them. So what we are doing now, like, you know, putting myself out there, trying to explain to people, it's all like um, ways and means for you to start. The diaspora and office exists. There are so many people you can call and offices that when I first came, I didn't know. But now we know that there's help, right? The right network is important because if you ask a friend who lives in Ghana, oh, I'm looking for a good carpenter. They're going to give you what they think is a good carpenter, not necessarily even a carpenter. So chances are somebody can dupe you, take your money, and not give you what you want. So the right network and the right connections, like if you're going to buy a land, make sure you are buying it from the right source. Make sure it's documented. If you need a carpenter, make sure that the source is coming from somebody that's experienced it. If you need a mason, like everything that we are doing is supposed to help provide some of these talents for us, you know. Having a team, of course, is the most important thing in every aspect of every job that you will do. Um, having the right team is probably the hardest thing you will face. And um, I think it's all about how you deal with people. You, you have to learn from your mistakes, from your team's mistakes, and you also have to be a kind person. It's sometimes really hard for somebody to dupe you when you treated them so well, right? So I guess in general, you need to be human, right? And know how to relate to people to be able to build your own team. Leadership is sort of by an example. If whatever you want people to be, you have to be that person. When people walk in here, they're like, oh, Patricia, you're so polite and you're so humble. And it reflects on your staff. So I'm like, hmm, I never thought of it like that. So if you are yelling at people and treating people, you know, in a nasty way, obviously you're going to rub off on your staff a little and you're going to replicate, you know. So however you want to be treated, if you treat your customers or your guests or whatever, even your staff the right way, I think it, it's like um, reciprocal. Like people will look at that, your staff will be like, oh, this is how my CEO or my manager behaves. So I can't yell at a customer, I can't do this. But I think it's like you lead by example, right? For me, it wasn't that one moment, right? It was always an ongoing thing. It was an ongoing project. Like from 16, I knew I was going to build a Disney world. Everybody knew, all my teachers, even in Syracuse University. All my professors knew. When I went to work for IBM, all my teammates, they like, oh, Patricia, I'm going to build Disney world. And I used to show them pictures when I bought the land. I'm like, look, this is what I'm building. It's a Disney, they're like, right. So it wasn't that one moment that I was like, oh, I'm going. It was always a project. Like whatever I was doing, the Disney World was a project. But I wasn't planning to move to Ghana like in my 20s. I was planning to move here like in my 50s or something, right? But during, um, I think between 2008 and 10, the whole economic crisis in the U.S., maybe kind of decide that hmm, maybe th this is it. Plus, my mom who was taking care of me wasn't well. So I'm like, let me just go spend some time with her, take care of her before I regret it. There was like so many little things came together. I, I, I like, I was over the place with reading, but I think the book that moved me was A Thousand Splendid Sons. I think the book is set in Afghanistan. And um, it, it showcased how women struggle, right? So I, I, I thought, hmm, this is a very interesting book. And um, 
how like a lot of things women gotta give up for I guess the world to move. Why should people come to Wild Wing? It's not just about us making money. It's about the dream. And the dream is just big. Like my aim is to actually have a vocational school that teaches only agriculture. Because take a look around us. It's all green. I, I don't see the point that we have to beg for food. We have to bring other things from other countries. I think food should be like, <laughs> if you like come to a war with us, we start beating you with food because we have plenty. We need to realize our potential. When you come to Wildwind, it's all about supporting that dream. Because that's the only reason why I will be in Ghana. Just making sure we do it better. Why should Africans eat African? It's not even just about eating African. It's about patronizing African product. I mean, just think about it this way. If you have money and you can buy furniture, beautiful furniture from Ghana, and you go to Italy or Western countries to bring the furniture in, and you expect the person who makes furniture to make money or come to your hotel or come and buy something from you. It makes you, I don't even want to say it, like if you think about it, how is that person going to have money if you don't support their businesses? Like all Africans are doing is supporting foreign businesses. China, I'm sorry, is the awful truth. Like every African should make a conscious effort to buy Africa. I don't even understand why you want to eat chicken from America or Mexico or Brazil. Does that even make sense to you? Like after eating chicken that I thought was from Ghana and one day it just dawned on me like to look at the box. I thought it was packaged well and it said product of Brazil and I thought how? Brazil is so far. Like how long did that chicken stay frozen in some freezer in Brazil and how long did it last on the ocean? How long did that chicken stay in Tema? How long did it take for that chicken to get to Kumasi and get to Lake Busumche for me to eat it? It, it, it makes no sense. I'm, I'm sorry, Africa. We got to wake up, make a conscious effort to eat local stuff so our locals can have money. Like, if you think we're going to have money, like the president should have taxes um, and do your road, but you are eating chicken from Brazil. I, you are just plain, I'm sorry, dumb. That, I, I can't put it any better. It makes no sense. You get me? Eat African, uh, buy African clothes. I mean, if we don't make it, that's different. If there's something you want that we don't make, fine. Let's buy it from someone else. But let's make that effort to learn how it's done so we can do it right here and buy in our own stuff, create jobs, right? Um, jobs will lead to taxes. Taxes will lead to better roads, hospitals, and schools. Um, if we haven't figured that out yet, then what we are teaching in school should be changed. Our curriculums should be changed altogether. Um, I get so passionate about this subject that I actually think each and every one of us who don't get this concept should just go back to school. Take orange juice, for example. I don't want to mention any names, but when you pour orange juice in a box in Ghana that's made in Mexico, it looks white. I'm like, wait, why is orange juice white? Um, hello, it's just sugar, color, and water. Africans, look at oranges, plants. Sell, make your own, and let's live better. Let's cut out the diseases, diabetes, osteoporosis, um, mental illnesses. Come on. I, I can't stress on how important it is to support Africa now. I just think if, you know, you are a conscious person, you got to figure that out on your own. It's like the diaspora is coming into Ghana. 
you are here because you want to support. Um, when you come in, into Wadway, for example, and let's say your AC cut off and you are hot. Um, hello, that's Africa. That's the real Africa for you, right? I mean, if you go to the place that you get everything, like in America, you go to your Holiday Inn, you go to your Marriott, right? You are giving them money so they can do it better. Better, let me bring my Ghanaian accent in, right? If you supported local businesses like mine, we don't have that money to buy that big plant. We don't have money to get that huge um, uh, solar panels. You can equip us to do it better. But if you keep throwing your money at people who have it already, as though Holiday Inn and Marriott needs more money from Africa, you are here because you want to help. But if you want luxury, stay in America. Like the whole point is coming to change it. But if you come and you don't stay in a place like this, this is the real Africa. Holiday Inn, Marriott Hotel in Accra could be anywhere. It could be Paris, it could be Manhattan, it could be anywhere. But that shouldn't be the reason you come here. If you want to be Africans, if you want to experience what we experience, come stay a night without AC. Stay a night without hot water. Come pick your banana to eat. Pick your orange. That's the real Africa. So I'm telling you, all the diasporans outside, you also need to make a conscious effort to come to support. I mean, it's nice to support and make money, right? But the idea, the, the reason that you come here shouldn't be making money first. It should be making a change first. Then when the money comes, aiming to that, that's a double win for all of us. The change is all about uh, looking at the potential um, places where you can strengthen us and making sure we do it better. I will want to see the day where Wadden has everything and everything is moving forward like a Marriott and we can compete with the Marriott and Holiday Inns. But yeah, for real, you, when you come to Africa, do local things, um, drink the palm wines, um, drink the pitos, the sobolos, like the real Africa and change somebody's life. You, you get what I mean? Make a change in someone's life because your pito is going straight into the pocket of some local farmer. You don't need the purified pito that's bottled and all of that. You, you need the straight pito from the farm. Hey, come to Wildwind, we give you pito. People come and they, there was a lady who sued her travel agent because I think um, she stayed in some luxury hotel in Accra uh, around 2021. She wanted this, the birds, she wanted the, the goats, the chickens, the, you know, the farm. They put her in a luxury hotel. She's like, no, this is New York. I don't want New York. I want Africa. So when you come, get Africa. Don't stay in America because staying in an American hotel in Accra is you being in America. Come on, guys. There's a lot of garbage in the African market, in Ghanaian market. Like, you taste some things and it's like so sweet that you, you don't feel like children should even be drinking it. Somebody should be testing that product to make sure it's safe for the Ghanaian to consume. I mean, we know diabetes is like highest among black people. So if someone is bringing garbage into the country, somebody should regulate that. You go to some offices and no one is there. I'm sorry, you guys, you gotta work. Like 10 o'clock, you walk into a government office and no one is in there. How do you expect the country to move forward when the government is paying you, but no results are coming out of it? You guys gotta work, come on. Do your job well. Make sure that if you are responsible for testing some product, you are testing it. Like, why are um, Ghanaian farmers saying that they don't have enough feed for their chicken? And it's like, as a result of that, we have to bring in foreign chicken. That doesn't even make any sense. When I was growing up, I don't remember us having foreign chickens or like stuff like that in the market. Now, 
the average person doesn't even think about what they are eating. They want chicken, they just go in and buy chicken. I'm urging every Ghanaian to stop eating foreign chicken and rice. Did you know the Ghanaian rice is the best the awache that we had? That was the local rice. If we support foreign rice, how would the local farmer make it? They can't even buy the machine to um, take out the, um, what is it, the skin for the corn. They have to beat it. How? I mean, how many bags can a single family be? In order to get that machine that will clean the rice, we have got to patronize their farm. Please, Africans, Ghanaians, think. When it's all said and done and I'm gone, I want grandkids and uh, future kids to remember me as the person who helped change Ghana, if not all of Africa. Because I think no one is going to change Africa for us. We have got to change it ourselves uh, positively, right? If we sit down waiting for somebody to change it, uh, we have no idea what kind of mindset they bring in, right? It's like, you know, narrating our own stories, right? It's about time that we took matches into our hands. We realized what we have. I mean, 60% of the world's arable lands in Africa. Come on. I mean, if it was up to me, no food will ever, ever come from anywhere besides Africa for us. I think we can do so much. And as long as I'm alive, I'm going to make sure that I keep preaching that there's so much we can do. So my name, again, is Patricia Che, or for Ghanaians who know me, Adria Foriwa. And um, you've just seen the wonder that we have over here. Beautiful Lake Um, You pray that you support, come and support Ghanaian businesses.